Thank you very much. Uh, well, I <coughs> believe I have to start with uh, justifying uh, the fact that I'm talking on this subject. I'm neither a mathematician nor a neuroscientist. As you will see in a moment, there will be some neuroscience here. Uh, but I find that the problem that I will try to talk of quite interesting, and, and in a way it uh, springs from two uh, kinds of, of research I do. One uh, concerns the problem of rule following, the role of language in uh, logic, mathematics, and other uh, uh, such disciplines, on the one hand, and uh, the second field uh, is the problem of the mathematical subject uh, research that I carry out with Adam Olszewski. So, although I'm neither a mathematician nor a neuroscientist, I will try to say from a philosophical perspective a few things about uh, the problem of the empirical subject in the philosophy of mathematics. Now, uh, roughly speaking, uh, and this, I'm fully aware of the, of the fact that this is uh, a bold generalization, uh, one can speak of uh, different mathematical subjects in the sense of, of, of different uh, subjects who are capable of doing mathematics. Uh, we can probably speak of a platonic subject, uh, which is in the strong reading, someone who perceives all mathematical objects at once, uh, someone who can see actual infinity, and that's probably uh, maybe God only. Uh, in, the weak ver in the weak version, a platonic subject is someone who can see any mathematical objects, but not, uh, mathemat not all mathematical objects at once. The second notion uh, of a mathematical subject we can distill, in a way, from various views of, uh, of from various philosophies of mathematics is the view of the transcendental subject which is some ideal projection of human mathematical capacities, uh, such that, that has no space or time limitation, uh, limitations and can grasp, in a way, potential infinity. And notable examples are, of course, Kant's philosophy of mathematics, uh, Brouwer and his intuitionism. Uh, I would even go as far as say that a kind of transcendental subject is presupposed by the, by the Hilbert's program and the, and the Hilbert's philosophy of mathematics. And finally, we can speak of also of empirical subjects, uh, subjects that can somehow perceive mathematical objects, but these are subjects we, which have, do have space and time uh, limitations. Uh, and once again, I treat it as a very bold generalization, because if we were to go into the details of different philosophies of mathematics, the exact realizations of those uh, ideas are quite different. Uh, but uh, the interesting thing is that I believe that the mainstream philosophy of mathematics in the 20th century is a mathematics that assumes some kind of transcendental subject. Uh, one argument in favor of this thesis uh, is the rejection of uh, psychologism at the beginning of the 20th century in the philosophy of mathematics, the famous arguments by Frege or uh, Husserl. Uh, the other is that even in the mathematical practice or uh, on the border, let's say, of the mathematical practice, uh, the controversy between the transcendental subject and the empirical one uh, reappear. For instance, uh, in the middle, uh, in, in mid-20th century, uh, Jean Port published a paper which aimed at uh, disproving uh, Church's thesis, claiming that there are such big numbers which cannot be calculated uh, even if uh, we had at our disposal uh, the entire uh, lifetime of the universe. Uh, and in his famous reply, uh, Mendelssohn claimed that Port uh, misunderstood something uh, that the subject that does mathematics or the, the subject of which the church's thesis says something uh, uh, a subject that, that has the capability intuitive capability, capability of uh, uh, of calculating a certain function 
uh, is not an empirical subject, it is in a way a transcendental subject, something which has no space or time limitations. Now, the title of my talk is uh, The Return of the Empirical Subject in the Philosophy of Mathematics. Uh, why the return? The reason is simple. As I said, uh, the, idea of, the ideas of psychologists have been summarily, let's say, uh, rejected uh, and reappeared only from time to time. But the last 20 years, or during the last 20 years, we have witnessed uh, very serious research done by neuroscientists on the human mathematical capacities. So, what I will try to do today is to look at the findings of neuroscience as regards mathematical skills, and I will try to uh, ask the question where those findings lead us, uh, and in particular, whether they may be uh, a basis for developing, on the one hand, more modestly, uh, a certain view of a mathematical subject, a subject capable of doing mathematics, but uh, in a stronger version, whether it leads us to a new conception of philosophy of mathematics. Uh, so let me start with uh, a very quick review of what's been done uh, in neuroscience. Uh, Stanislas, uh, Stanislas uh, Diem, the famous French neuroscientist, who did uh, a lot of work in this field, uh, entitled his famous book, The Number Sense, uh, and it relates to our inborn, capa capa inborn mathematical capacity. capacities. Those capacities uh, are limited to dealing with small numbers only. Uh, what is interesting is uh, those inborn skills are cross-model, so it is not important in which way a number is presented, uh, whether we see a number of objects, whether we hear a number of uh, sounds. Uh, uh, moreover, the inborn mathematical uh, capacities enable us to understand simple mathematical operations performed on small numbers. And it is uh, implicated that there are two uh, brain systems which are responsible for those skills, the so-called object tracking system and the approximate number system. Uh, the OTS is a system that enables tracking simultaneously three to four individuals. And so it enables the so-called subitizing, which is an, the instant and highly accurate determination of a number of objects in small collection, up to four elements. Uh, and it is believed that it is more or less located in the posterior parietal and occipital regions of the brain. Uh, ANS, approximate number system, is a system for representing the approximate number of items in sets. So it's a system which enables us, with, when we see two sets with different numbers of objects, to say uh, which of the sets contains more uh, objects. This is a system which works according to so-called Weber's law. Uh, the threshold of discrimination between two stimuli increases linearly with stimulus intensity. And uh, the important thing is that the Weber's fraction or the smallest variation to a quantity that can be readily perceived changes over human development. Uh, how does it change? Uh, in the following way, that newborns, for, for newborns the Weber's fraction is 1 to 3, uh, for 6 month olds it's 1 to 2, for 1 year old children it's 2 to 3, for 4 year olds 3 to 4, for 7 year olds 4 to 5, and so on. Uh, of course, as when we speak of those basic mathematical skills, uh, there is also uh, much, uh, well, there's, uh, there was much more uh, research, for instance, concerning numerical skills in animals, uh, not only in primates, but also in, uh, in birds, for instance. Uh, and this is uh, a research that points out to only approximate mathematical skills in animals. Uh, there is research uh, concerning our counting uh, skills and uh, our memory limitations. For instance, our work working memory can uh, store simultaneously only four uh, elements. Uh, uh, much effort is devoted to the so-called Snark effect, the Snark effect uh, an effect discovered by Stanislas Diem and 
his team in the early 1990s. Uh, it's an effect which, in a way, uh, implicates that there is some connection between the representation of space, times, uh, uh, time, and number in the brain. Uh, it was discovered in the following way. There was a very uh, simple procedure. Uh, there was a number displayed on the screen, uh, and uh, the task for the adult participants uh, was to press right button if the number was odd, left button if the number was even, uh, and interestingly enough, the bigger the numbers were, um, uh, the more often uh, the right button was pressed, uh, uh, and it had nothing to do with whether the number was odd or even. So the idea is that numbers are represented as a, as a line, and bigger numbers are to the right, smaller numbers are to the left. Uh, uh, there is also a lot of interesting findings concerning geometrical skills, as in the case of arithmetics, there are two systems uh, implicated, the 2D system and 3D system. Uh, again, uh, they are very simple uh, systems for representing uh, space. Uh, so, uh, what I want to propose is that we can speak of inborn or to coin a word, ingrained mathematics, uh, which in the case of arithmetics consists of the OTS and ANS systems, uh, which enable exact counting up to four and approximate number recognition, which depends on uh, the Weber's fraction. Now, uh, the problem, the question which we need to pose right now is how to get from the, those limited capacities of OTS and ANS to the beautiful and complex universe of mathematical objects. Is it possible at all? The problem is that uh, when we look at the neuroscientific practice, uh, they are dealing with a much uh, smaller problem. That is the problem of how to break what I call the four barrier. So how is it possible? What uh, needs to happen in the normal development of a child for, for a child to start counting uh, or using numbers which are higher than four? So exceeding the OTS uh, capability. In a normal development, uh, or at least uh, developmental psychologists tell so, say so, uh, at six months infants can add and subtract one, at two they begin to learn sequences of counting words but do not map the words onto the numbers they represent, half a year later they recognize that number words mean more than one, at four children can use fingers to add adding, between second and fourth year they learn to map number words 1, 2, 3, and 4 uh, to the corresponding cardinalities, one after another. But it may take up to six months to move from one num number word to another to be associated with the number itself. Now, there are different hypotheses as how this is achieved. For instance, Curry speaks of the so-called bootstrapping, uh, this is the idea that on the basis of what the child knows from the OTS system, the exact system, uh, she concludes that the fiveness identified by the ANS system is the exact number five. And so it goes. Uh, Piazza, uh, on the other hand, suggests that uh, it is only the ANS system which is responsible for breaking the number four bar barrier. Uh, and uh, she says that it is due to the fact that the sensitivity of the ANS system increases with time. Finally, the, the, more, the most interesting uh, speculation is that by Spelke, and this is the one I will try to uh, develop further, uh, she says that the possibility of breaking the four barrier, of exceeding our inborn mathematical skills, uh, is possible uh, through the acquisition, acquisition of language. Uh, uh, she says that children appear to overcome the limits of the core number system when they begin to use number words in natural language expressions and counting. So the jump from four to five requires to understand that every word in the counting, counting list designates a set of individuals with a unique cardinal value and to grasp the idea that each cardinal value can be constructed through progressive addition of one. And she concludes that for most children, the language of number words 
and verbal counting appears to provide the critical system of symbols for combining the two core systems, ANS and OTS, and some evidence suggests that language may be necessary for this construction. What is this evidence? Which says that the acquisition of language is indispensable in the development of the mathematical skills. For instance, uh, the fact that children, ad adults in remote cultures, whose languages have no words for numbers, when dealing with numbers larger than three, recognize their equivalence only approximately. So it's, it suggests that only the ANS system is at work here. Or that deaf persons living in numerate cultures, but not exposed to deaf community, use fingers to communicate numbers, but only with approximate accuracy. Or that educated adults uh, who suffer language impairments have problems with exact but not approximate numerical reasoning. Or that when doing exact but not approximate tasks, uh, adults spend more time with numbers that are difficult to pronounce, even if they are presented in Arabic notation. Or finally, uh, that bilingual adults who are taught some new mathematical facts in one of their languages have difficulties in smooth production of exact number facts in the other language. Now, this does not take us uh, quite, uh, well, very far on our way to Council of Heaven. Uh, in a way, Spelke's hypothesis uh, tries to say how to break the, 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 the four barrier. Uh, fortunately, there is, a, I need to stress, a very speculative theory uh, by Lacov and Nunez, uh, who try to say how this move from the inborn mathematics to our uh, regular mathematical practice is possible. They work within the so-called embodied paradigm. It's a way of approaching not only uh, development of mathematical skills, but of uh, understanding what language is, uh, what the mind is, and so on and so on. Uh, the idea is that cognition, not only, as I said, of mathematical object, but objects, but cognition, uh, tutku, uh, is embodied as it is grounded in simulations of sensory motor processes through the use of neural resources that are also active in bodily perception and action. Uh, so their idea is that uh, our neural motor control programs serve as the basis for the establishment or the development of the brain of the so-called mental scheme schemes uh, those mental schemes are concrete concepts of uh, usually spatial, temporal uh, events or aspects of events. And then uh, the process of metaphorization. But metaphors should be understood metaphorically here. So metaphor is a certain mechanism which uh, uh, enables one to use, uh, to, to form one concept on the, on the basis of another concept. Uh, so a concept from the source domain to the target domain. And in this way, from those concrete concepts, which are deeply rooted in uh, our, or connected to our neural motor control programs, we get abstract concepts, for instance, the mathematical ones, number addition, and so on and so on. Uh, for instance, the, they claim that there are four basic metaphors of arithmetic. Uh, the arithmetic as object collection metaphor is a metaphor where, where the source domain concept of collections of objects of the same size is mapped to the concept of numbers, the size of the collection is mapped to the size of the number, and, and so on. Uh, the arithmetic as object construction metaphor is a metaphor where the source domain concept of objects consisting of ultimate parts of unit size is mapped to the concept of numbers, or the act of object construction is mapped to the concept of arithmetic operations and so on. Uh, there are also the measuring stick metaphor and the arithmetic as motion along a path metaphor. Uh, it is not important to go to, into the details of this, as I said, highly speculative theory. The interesting thing is that uh, Lakov and Nunez provi provide us with some idea of how to move from the inborn mathematics uh, to the abstract mathematical concepts. And I know of no other theory that would show how this is possible. 
So I do not claim that this conception of lack of a newness is the ultimate one, uh, but at least this is an idea. And additionally, there is some further uh, quite interesting evidence that corroborates at least the, this general scheme that they uh, suggest. Uh, because what I wanted to say, uh, or I, I for, forgot to say, that uh, the evidence they quote is mainly based on uh, linguistic findings, so it has no direct ties to neuroscience. Uh, generally, so summing up this part, I would say that mathematics, uh, in addition to being inbrained or inborn, is also embodied. Uh, and embodied mathematics, in contrast to more modest approaches, does, does draw the line from the workings of the OTS and ANS system to our mathematical practices. It is a road that goes through our concrete bodily experiences are, as reflected in language. In a way, then, one can think, think of their theory as a concretization of Spelter's bold claim that the road to counter heaven is through language. Now, the question is, what is language if it constitutes a scaffolding for our mathematical practices? And again, generally speaking, we can, we can uh, name or identify two approaches to what language is. The first is the Chomskyan paradigm, and the other is the paradigm I will, would like to speak a few words of, because I believe that, first of all, I believe that the Chomskyan, Chomskyan approach is simply false, for reasons which well, cannot be cited here. Uh, but secondly, it is the second approach uh, which is coherent with what we've said so far. The second approach is links language with imitation. Uh, and there is an evolutionary scenario which was developed, for instance, by Mervyn Donald or Michael Tomasello. Uh, it's a theory according to which language, evolutionarily speaking, uh, emerged or developed from a communication system which was based on gestures. Uh, they speak of the so-called mimetic or imitation skills. Uh, and they claim that the emergence of those imitation or mimetic skills precedes the emergence of spoken language. There is good evidence that this is roughly true. So what they say, their thesis is the thesis culture first. Culture is something which evolved before language, spoken language evolved. Uh, in the case of uh, Chomsky would say that his conception is language first. Uh, which only gave rise to the development of culture. So uh, language on this account is not an individual but network level phenomenon. Uh, cognitive neuroscientists, says Merlin Donald, are unlikely to find an innate language acquisition device and should redirect their investigations toward the powerful analog processing systems out of which language can emerge in group interactions. Because if language is based on imitation, then the crucial ele element in the acquisition of language and in uh, the phylogenetic uh, emergence or development of language is the social interaction. Uh, another uh, side of the coin is the neuroscientific aspect of this problem, uh, as developed, for instance, by Michael Arby. He proposes the so-called neurosystem neuro hypothesis. As we well know, uh, the Broca's area is the area of the brain implicated in the production of speech. And Arbit uh, observes that Broca's area has been evolutionarily built upon a perception system responsible for the recognition and, and execution of manual actions. Uh, so he proposes the following evolutionary path from uh, mirror systems, which are responsible for perception and execution of manual actions, through the ability to imitate manual gestures, uh, emergence of pantomimic skills, uh, uh, to the emergence of the so-called proto-science and the emergence of proto-language. Uh, it may be quite clear right now that this view of the development of language may be easily reconciled with Nunez and Lakoff's view of the embodied uh, language. Uh, as we remember, X schemes or X schemas, which were quite important for uh, their idea, uh, they have exactly the right structure to characterize the collection of concepts that linguists refer to as aspect, concepts that characterize the structure of events and our reasoning about 
uh, events. In other words, those X schemas which come from uh, our sensory motor uh, capacities serve to construct concrete concepts which, through the process of metaphorization, become abstract ones. Uh, so, in addition to uh, say, speaking of mathematics as uh, embrained and embodied, we can also say that it is embedded in the sense uh, that language is co-constituted co by imitated social practices and so is mathematics. So I, I, I want to call this theory the 3E theory of mathematics. Uh, two, two consequences of this theory are the following, that our mathematical skills and mathematical knowledge do not have a separate phylogenetic or ontogenetic trajectory. Mathematics is not a standalone separate knowledge, it is intimately intertwined with all that we call culture. Uh, and the second interesting consequence is that the fact that language is embedded uh, explains the stability of mathematical knowledge. The, the stability may be explained by observing that we have similar bodily experiences which give rise to concrete concepts and then to metaphorization to abstract concepts, but also that uh, stability results from the imitation process. We imitate the same patterns of behavior, including uh, those connected with mathematics. Now, there are at least three challenges to this theory. One is the exist existence of mathematical genius. Idiot savant, uh, prodigies, geniuses. Uh, second is mathematical platonism, and third is, third is the mathematicity of the universe. I will know, uh, I don't have time to, to go uh, through the first point, so I will concentrate on the later two. Uh, when we speak of mathematical platonism, we speak of a cluster of ideas which are very nicely encapsulated by Jan Lukasiewicz in reference to logic when he says, Whenever I deal with the smallest logical problems, I always have the feeling that I am facing some powerful, incredibly coherent and enormously resistant structure. I cannot make any changes within it. I create nothing, but working hard, I uncover new details, gaining eternal truths. Philosophers of mathematics, uh, again, in a quite boldly way, uh, bold way uh, say that mathematical Platonism rests on three thesis. The existence thesis, that mathematical objects or structures exist. The abstractness thesis, that they are abstract or non-spatial temporal entities. And the independence thesis, that mathematical objects are independent of any rational or irrational activities of the human mind. Now, what are the arguments for those thesis? The general argument for the existence thesis uh, is due to Frege and was very nicely rephrased by Balaguer. Uh, and it is the following argument. Uh, premise 1. Mathematical sentences are true. 2. Mathematical sentences should be taken at their face value. So there is no deep structure behind surface structure in mathematics. So when you had the idea of deep structure and surface structure was made famous by Russell. For instance, when he analyzed this, fa this famous sentence that the present king of France is bold, and he said the surface structure of the sentence is different than the deep structure. In mathematics, we cannot make this division. Uh, and this is what the second premise says. Then third, by Quine's criterion, we are ontologically committed to the existence of objects which are values of the variables and the sentences we consider true. So we are ontologically committed to the existence of mathematical objects. And this general scheme is filled in different ways, especially as regards to the justification for thesis one, that mathematical sentences are true. One option, option is, is, is the indispensability argument by Quine, Quine and Patna, our best theory of the world is contemporary physics and mathematics. Uh, and mathematics is indispensable for physical theories. One cannot formulate general theory of relativity or quantum mechanics without the use of mathematics. The second argument, due to Gödel, is the intuition-based argument. He says that some mathematical facts are obvious. They force themselves upon us as being true. And if some mathematical facts are not obvious in this way, they are unobser unobservable mathematical facts, we judge their truthfulness by the ver verifiable consequences they have within the realm of what is uh, accessible to our intuition. Uh, 
In addition, there are some arguments for the independence thesis, that mathematical objects are independent of us. Uh, one of such arguments would be the unexpected consequences arguments. As I think Popper says, we have not invented prime numbers. Or uh, the first for me, uh, like uh, in Professor Maslanko's talk, uh, that someone has formulated the zeta function, but did not foresee all the beautiful uh, features of this function which were discovered later. The second is the semantic argument uh, that mathematical sentences are true irrespective of whether we know it or not. And this is the big uh, fight between Platonists and intuitionists. Uh, uh, so this is a platonic argument for the independence thesis. Uh, now, what Lakov and Nunes say in this context? It's a very bad philosophy, I'm afraid. They say that the only access that human beings have to any mathematics at all, either transcendent or otherwise, is through concepts in our minds that are shaped by our bodies and brains and realized physically in our neural systems. For human beings or any other embodied beings, mathematics is, is embodied mathematics. The only mathematics we can know is mathematics that our bodies and brains allow us to know. For this reason, the theory of embodied mathematics is anything but inconcuse. As a theory of the only mathematics we know or can know, it is a theory of what mathematics is, what it really is. This is a very bad argument. Uh, neither Junius nor Lakov address the problem, the indispensability thesis. They may have some uh, ground to deal with the intuition-based uh, argument, but they do not address the unexpected consequences argument, and so on, and so on, and so on. So really, they do not the discussion is not with Platonists, but with some phantom they produced uh, and called it uh, mathematical Platonism. However, they identify a certain tension. The tension is that, on the one hand, we, it is we who created our mathematics through the metaphorization of our concrete concepts, yet the mathematics we created seems to be independent of us. Now, the second problem uh, is the mathematicity of the universe. Again, broadly speaking, this is a thesis that the universe should be ascribed a feature which makes it the mathematical method especially efficient in our efforts to study the universe. And this uh, thesis consists of two sub -thesis. The factual thesis that progress in physics is strictly connected to the use of the mathematical method, and the miracle thesis uh, due to Wigner and uh, the aspect uh, so uh, much stressed by Michael Heller that the universe could have been mathematical yet impenetrable with our mathematics. And again, Lakov and Nunez have some observations on this. For instance, no one observes laws of the universe as such. What are observed empirically are regularities in the universe. Laws are mathematical statements made up by human beings to attempt to characterize those regularities experienced in the physical universe. Or, what the physicists do in formulating laws is fit their human conceptualization of the physical regularities to their prior human conceptualization of some form of mathematics. All the fitting between mathematics and physical regularities of the physical world is done within the minds of physicists who comprehend both. The mathematics is in the mind of the mathematically trained observer, not in the regularities of the physical universe. Again, uh, tragically bad philosophy. Uh, they do not properly address the factual thesis and they fail to appreciate the miracle thesis. What they left unaccounted for is, for instance, that the sometimes equations no more than their creators, like in the case of the cosmological equations of um, uh, Einstein, or that mathematics is efficient, efficient in dealing with microscale phenomena, phenomena, not only macroscale, or that mathematics tells us where to look for the regularities. Um, so, uh, it seems that uh, those two problems I raised, the problem of the Platonism in mathematics and the problem of the mathematicity of the universe, uh, cannot be so easily addressed as lack of and unions do it. So the question is how to account for the necessity and deficiency of mathematics within the 3E, e, the triple E theory. And my suggested answer is that we need to revive Karl Popper's conception of three worlds. As you remember, according to Popper, world one is the physical, uh, the world of physical object, objects, world two is the world of mental phenomena, world three is the world of abstract objects, including mathematics. The interesting thing is that 
And please note uh, that fact. Uh, Popper says that word three emerges with the emergence of language. So language as a whole is necessary for the word three to come into being. I would suggest uh, a certain modification to this. Uh, Popper believes that the word three emerges on the basis of word two only. Uh, I would suggest that word three does not emerge from word two alone. It is based on, or if you wish, supervenes on our mental attitudes and social interactions, which stresses the key role of imitation and the theory of, of uh, language and imitation I sketched a moment ago. And there are special features of this word. It exists. Uh, uh, Popper defines existence in a special way. He says whatever exercises influence over something else exists. We created it, says Popper, but it is autonomous or independent of us. It consists of abstract objects. Uh, mathematics, and this is quite important, is only a part of word three, which is coherent with the imitation-based view of language and culture, and so with the 3D theory. Uh, and thus mathematical objects, because they are part of the bigger word, the word three, are not sui generis, they are not queer in the sense of Mackie's uh, argument from queerness. Finally, our theories, constructed with the use of mathematics, says Popper, that belong to the word three, asymptotically approach, to approach the truth. Or we can say, using Michael Herrer's idea of the mathematics with the capital M, they uncover the structure of the universe, which is mathematical, where mathematics is written with the capital M. So the general idea is that we have the embraced mathematics, the basic skills I mentioned in the beginning, embodied mathematics, which is the barrier breaking mathematics, which paves the way to the, the country's heaven, let's say, embedded mathematics. Uh, so mathematics is embedded, and this based uh, on social interactions, and this gives mathematics, mathematical practice its stability. But then we have the transcendent mathematics with the capital M, which in a way explains, at least philosophically speaking, the necessity of mathematical construction and the, the efficient, its efficiency in the study of nature. And uh, the final three remarks, is the empirical subject back when we accept the, this rough outline I presented? Uh, what we can say is that we have very limited inborn, mathema inborn mathematical capacities. Uh, so in a way, this is the empirical aspect. Then our road to Cantor's heaven leads to our bodily experiences if uh, the imitation-based view of language and the embodied approach of uh, lack of unions are roughly true. Uh, however, we cannot do it alone. Mathematics, the development of mathematics, is our joint enterprise in a non-trivial sense. Not only many people contribute to the development of mathematics, but the small m mathematics is co-constituted by our shared practices. So there is no mathematics of the empirical subject, it is rather mathematics of empirical subjects. Uh, however, mystery, possibly again with the capital uh, letter, remains. Uh, and once again, I refer to the necessity of mathematical constructions and mathematics efficiency in the study of nature. Thank you. Very much. Well, thank you very much for this interesting lecture. And now we have time for questions and comments. Uh, I think that the problem with the genius in mathematics is quite great in this case because uh, if we did have uh, some small inborn capacities, then, for example, what about the genius of Gauss, who at the age of three was able to do some calculations by his father, and at the age of seven was able to do some even more <coughs> calculations? So, okay. the question how to, how, to, uh, how to adjust to yeah. such cases uh, in this theory? Yeah. But there, there are a few problems here. Uh, before I come to math mathematical genius par excellence, there is, for instance, a big problem with the so-called idiot savant. So people who, for instance, autistic, autistic people who do not have any social skills, they do not possess lang linguistic skills, nevertheless, uh, uh, they, for instance, can quite quickly identify prime numbers. Uh, there are several theories as to how this is possible. But one of them is that uh, uh, it is 
because uh, brain resources are not uh, devoted to the development of language and so on and so on, they are devoted to the uh, expansion of the ANS system. So in a way, this this is uh, uh, this is still so uh, in in no case, uh, when we speak of those idiots of all, they cannot. Uh, produce even a very simple mathematical proof. Uh, so, sometimes it is uh, suggested that they cannot, cannot make division, simple division. Uh, so uh, the idea is that uh, the lack of some skills, linguistic skills in this situation, uh, gives resources to the, the, the further development of some inborn mathematical capacities that they are bigger or uh, uh, more powerful than in the case of, of, of normally functioning people. Uh, it is much more difficult in the case of geniuses. Uh, one observation is that many of the people who are mathematical geniuses had, uh, during their childhood, had a big problem, for instance, dyslalia, some kind of language impairment. This uh, is said to be true of Einstein, for instance. Uh, so, uh, again, the hypothesis would be that uh, because less brain resources were devoted to the development of linguistic skills, then uh, there was, let's say, place for uh, development of special mathematical skills. Uh, however, uh, there is uh, an interesting thing is to compare, uh, let's say, a phenomenological observations by mathematicians of how they do mathematics. On one hand, they very often claim uh, that when they do mathematics, they see something, but they, it's quite difficult for them to say what this seeing consists in. On the other hand, there is a very beautiful autobiography by, uh, by Richard Feynman. Yes, this is also on the end of the state board, because he did some research in this case, and he yeah. discovered that there were two groups of people. The first one, uh, while counting, there were seen numbers. The yeah. second one, while counting, were human with, with Paul Ollum. And the interesting yeah. thing was the fact that the first group was able to simultaneously not only count the numbers, but also, for example, recite the letters yeah. uh, of the ones that they had been yeah. raised before. The, yeah. second one, the second group was not able to do it. But uh, there is, from the point of view of what, what I was trying to say, there is more interesting thing. That is, when he, uh, uh, there, were, there were famous, uh, there was a famous competition in Los Alamos between him and Bethe, of who uh, is quicker at counting. And in both cases, it, it wasn't seeing something. They knew a number of mathematical tricks. Yes. And they memorized uh, the entire tables with, with some constants, let's say. So, uh, on the one hand, we have such uh, uh, observations that well, it is, they are seeing something more, or this is a, a kind of illumination. On the other, when you ask them of how they do it, that they come that, that quickly, or that they... Uh, it's very often that they have an entire arsenal of... Memorization. Memorization and tricks. But anyway, I believe that the, the, this is not a very philosophical problem. The, the, the problem of the mathematical genius is something at which neuroscience can make much progress in the future years. However, I believe at the same time that in the case of the mathematical Platonism or the efficiency of mathematics, uh, maybe this research will shed some light on this problem, but not to the extent uh, it can be done in the case of the mathematical genius. Any other questions? Yes, please. I have a, an empirical question, perhaps, to somebody who knows. Namely, there are a lot of studies how mathematics is developed, developed in infants. Yeah. But just symmetric questions, how mathematics dissipates in an old age. <laughs> so it's perhaps the most primitive mathematical structures disappear at the end, the last ones. Is uh, there any empirical investigation? I, I don't know. I, I think that for bioethical reasons, this may be banned as a kind of <laughs> I'm ready to experiment. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, please. I don't know if, if you have uh, taken into account the problem that we must have some brain capacities of social construction of mathematics. Other animals do not have. Yeah. Okay. Yes, the, that's the, the, this is the first question. Okay. Uh, simply speaking, our uh, 
capacity of social construction rests on the imitation skills. Sometimes, even in English, we, we, we say that to ape someone is to imitate someone. The truth is that in comparison with uh, human beings, uh, apes are very bad at imitation. Michael Tomasello says that children are imitation machines. So in a, imitation is the way at passing over uh, some patterns of behavior from generation to generation, and this enables what Tomasello calls the cu cumulative uh, cultural evolution. Uh, so this is the basic mechanism. Right now it has uh, an additional, but still quite vague, uh, evidential support from neuroscience and from the idea of the neuroscience, uh, neuro system hypothesis. But the, 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 these are, you know, just pieces of a puzzle that we try to put together. But there is one more thing I wanted to, uh, to say, and this is a good occasion, uh, that you can probably imagine other philosophies of mathematics, pure Platonism, uh, in some, in Gödel's uh, version, for instance. I believe that this is uh, not as good as a theory of mathematics for one simple reason. It is not coherent in the findings of neuroscience. Uh, as you saw, I do not want to reduce uh, mathematics to neuroscience because I believe it is um, impossible. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there should be some criteria for selecting between ontologies. And one of such criteria, from my point of view, is, the, is whether a given ontology is coherent with, in this case, the findings of evolutionary theory in neuroscience. Uh, because, uh, well, you can always be a relativist and say every ontology is good enough, or you can have some other criterion, but then we should discuss this criterion. Uh, so I, I just wanted to stress the, the coherence criterion, which is applied here, implicitly. Another question. Now this whole world of uh, top, top. I, I would say it would be more down to the earth. Uh, because when we speak about uh, similarity, uh, about uh, imitation, we speak about similarity. Similarity can be easily mathematized. So maybe we have been born in a linear manner just simple mathematics, but higher mathematics of the world is present in our mind in a non-linear way, in our capacity to distinguish similarities. Well, I think that neuroscience has a, a better, right now, a better explanation of how the similarities are, or the, the ability to uh, recognize similarities is accounted for, if the mirror system hypothesis is true. Because the idea is that uh, a mirror uh, system neurons fire when you do something and when you observe someone doing the same. And this leads to the so-called simulation theories. Uh, that is, uh, uh, I can identify a similarity because the same set of neurons uh, or the same constellation of neurons fires when I do something myself or when I uh, see it uh, as regards the second part of your question. Maybe there is, maybe there is uh, such a thing as uh, Penrose suggests that uh, there is some uh, that the human mind can calculate things that Turing machine cannot. Uh, but truth be told, there is no uh, empirical evidence so far to uh, substantiate this thesis. Both are metaphysical thesis. I would say so. However, uh, once again, I would apply the coherence criterion. I, I'm fully aware that what I was trying to present here, to a certain extent, is empirical, and there is a, an empirical theory. The higher we go on the hierarchy, it's more and more philosophical. But anyway, I, I, at least I, I, I hope it is, uh, to a certain extent, rational. And then uh, the question is that you have two ontologies, and those ontologies, one of them is incoherent with this model, the other is not. Uh, it, 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 mu it, it does not have to be uh, contradict. There, there is no need for contradiction to say coherence is a, a logical term. A coherent theory is not only uh, non-contradictory, but <coughs> also unified and there are... Uh, 
I am calling call yes. just for more natural, nothing more. And this is the last sentence, I promise. Uh, and, and, and what I, I'm trying to say is that I'm proposing implicitly a new view of naturalism. That naturalism is not a reduction, but uh, a, nat a naturalized philosophical theory is something which is coherent to a, a bigger extent, to a bigger degree, with uh, empirical theories that some other. It's a kind of generalization of the notion of naturalism. Well, I guess we came to the conclusion of our first afternoon session. Let us thank Mr. Brock again for his talk.